See, one of the interesting facts about Imam al-Ghazali, most people don't know, is that when the Byzantines entered Baytul Maqdis in Palestine, Imam al-Ghazali retired from public speeches and people in general for three years, although his lectures attracted people from all over the world. Imam al-Ghazali retired for three years on purpose and disappeared completely from the public until he made a plan to expel the Byzantines from Jerusalem. SubhanAllah, the insight, the basira that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted Imam al-Ghazali is so divine. His plans to defeat the Byzantines did not focus on carrying the sword in self-defense. His plans stemmed around the spiritual crises of the Muslims. How the, the Islamic spiritual traditions had become moribund and how the spiritual sciences taught by the first generations of Muslims had been forgotten. His efforts to revive the love of Islam was his core plan to defeat not only the Byzantines, but also any power on earth. Later on, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi made the works of Imam al-Ghazali part of One of the philosophical and psychological dilemmas we face today as Muslims, especially in the current climate, where the world is witnessing and watching a live genocide, one of the worst and dark times in history. People have become desensitized to what's happening and the Muslims, unfortunately, are in a state of perpetual weakness, a state of constant guilt and despair. Two billion strong yet weak, and this is one of the biggest psychological battles taking place right now. Are we seriously that weak and incapable of helping ourselves? Are we a defeated Ummah despite our large number? The entire world today perceives the Muslims to be not only irrelevant, but also worthless. And this is obviously manifested in the current events in the Muslim world. And honestly, this failure and the sad state of our Ummah remains our sole responsibility. But how did we get to this point? The entire Ummah is in this joint. We used to inspire people with our way of thinking and speech. We used to protect the oppressed under the siege. The orphans and the elders were under protection. We led with the example of justice and affection. Who knew the world would be silent watching a live genocide, witnessing children burnt live on the other side? All oh, Muslims, all you do is complain. Surely my Lord is not to blame. Remember, the presence of the Mahdi is near. Injustice, oppression, and tyranny will dis disappear. A promise from my Lord, he made it clear. Therefore, it is befitting to seriously ponder about the cause and the cure as well, if we are to reclaim the title, the best nation again. Let's not be delusional either by denying our weaknesses, and let's not remain defeated and lose hope. There is always that middle path between the two extremes. This Ummah was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the Prophet, and has decreed there will be followers of this last and final messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described this ummah saying, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. You were the best nation that came to being. Ukhrijat lin nas. Ukhrijat means like a hidden treasure. Something that was enveloped, it was enclosed, it was sealed, and it came out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not only say kuntum khayra ummatin, the best of the nation, and that's it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ukhrijat lin nas. He didn't say, ukhrijat fin nas. He didn't say it's the best of the nation that was ever brought to existence within the people. He said, for the people. Context is important. Grammar and syntax is extremely important in the Quran. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it the best and made it so special that there is something special in this ummah for all people, even at times like this.
times of defeat and irrelevance. The khayriya, the description that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, is not uplifted. Because he knows the ghayb, the unseen, the past, the present, and the future. The khayriya of this ummah includes its weaknesses and its strengths as well. The khayriya does not change. And that's why it's important to avoid being caught up in both extremes. So one would say we are the best of nation that has ever been brought to existence. And this is not like a supremacist type of attitude here. But best in terms of its humbleness, its servitude for humanity, and how it extends hand of peace and love to humanity. Which kind of embodies, embodies the... Uh, prophetic characters. This is the middle path. And the Quran emphasizes this, saying, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا Meaning, عَدْلًا خِيَارًا So the description of the khayriya is repeated again. Yet, we have to be very, very careful between taking this supremacist type of attitude from the delusional thinking that we're not weak at all. We're the perfect people ever created. Like what Bani Israel, the children of Israel, said, نَحْنُ شَعْبُ اللَّهِ الْمُخْتَارِ Meaning, we're the chosen people of God. الشعور بالاستعلاء والاستكبار على جميع الخلق داء عضال ومزمن عند الأمة اليهودية ذكره القرآن الكريم عندهم في آيات كثيرة وتزخر به نصوص كتبهم ومنها ما ورد في توراتهم المحرفة عندما تقول أنتم أولاد للرب إلهكم لأنكم شعب مقدس للرب إلهكم وقد اختاركم الرب لكي تكونوا له شعبا خاصا فوق جميع الشعوب الذين على وجه الأرض Meaning the Jews in their interpolated and forged Torah they said we are the chosen nation of God above all nations ويقولون أيضا بنو إسرائيل أحباء الله ويدعون أنهم أبناؤه ولهم برهان أعظم على هذا الحب وهو أن الله نفسه قد سماهم بهذا الاسم في قوله في التوراة عندما يقولون أنتم أولاد للرب إلهكم The children of Israel also claim they are not only the closest to God but also the most beloved children of God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys their claims of supremacy and lies in the Quran saying بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وقالت اليهود والنصارى نحن ابناء الله واحباؤه قل فلم يعذبكم بذنوبكم بل انتم بشر مما خلق يغفر لمن يشاء ويعذب من يشاء ولله ملك السماوات والارض وما بينهما واليه المصير صدق الله العظيم the Jews and the Christians each say we are the children of God and his most beloved Say, why then does he punish you for your sins? Nay, you are only humans, like others of his own making. He forgives whomever he wills and punishes whomever he wills. To God alone belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth and everything in between. And to him is the final return. We should avoid this feeling of supremacy that leads to the delusional thinking that we're not weak people and that we are the perfect people ever created. On the other hand, we should not look at defeat and helplessness as an immediate uh, precursor of the day of judgment or the end of this ummah. Do we have weaknesses? Absolutely. Do we have strengths? Of course we do. Even in the midst of what's happening in Palestine and in the Muslim world right now. The last thing we to do as Ummah is fall into despair. This Ummah of Muhammad والسلام, does not know what despair is. And there is, and this is the rational assessment and analysis of weaknesses and strengths that we should be talking about. The spiritual crises of the Muslims. See, one of the interesting facts about Imam al-Ghazali, most people don't know, is that when the Byzantines entered Baytul Maqdis in Palestine, Imam al-Ghazali retired from public speeches and people in general 
for three years, although his lectures attracted people from all over the world. Imam al-Ghazali retired for three years on purpose and disappeared completely from the public until he made a plan to expel the Byzantines from Jerusalem. Subhanallah, the insight, the basira that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted Imam al-Ghazali is so divine. His plans to defeat the Byzantines did not focus on carrying the sword in self-defense. His plans stemmed around the spiritual crises of the Muslims. How the, the Islamic spiritual traditions had become moribund and how the spiritual sciences taught by the first generations of Muslims had been forgotten. His efforts to revive the love of Islam was his core plan to defeat not only the Byzantines, but also any power on earth. Later on, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi made the works of Imam al-Ghazali part of the school curriculum. It was the teachings, the revival of the religious sciences that provided the true revival within Muslims towards liberating Al-Aqsa from Crusaders. His plans and works demonstrated in his book, Ihya Ulum al-Din, the revival of religious sciences, spiritual plans. And once the Ummah understood this and went back to the Islamic spiritual traditions, it was easy to defeat the Byzantines. Even notable historians throughout history testified that Al-Ghazali's project to free Bayt al-Maqdis from the Byzantines began with the spread of his book, Ihya Ulum al-Din. Imam al-Ghazali, like, like uh, Rabi al-Adawiyya, rahmatullahi alayha, spent 10 years in Jerusalem. While at the sanctuary of Al-Aqsa, he wrote Al-Qistas, Just Balance. He also wrote Mihakku nadar fil Mantiq, Touchstone of Reasoning of log in Logic. And also most of his treatise, uh, Ihya Ulum al-Din, that was actually written while sitting at the rooftop or, uh, top of Bab al-Rahma, building within the Al-Aqsa Sanctuary. I might do some videos about Imam al-Ghazali's books in the future, inshallah. Mainly my favorites, which is the Mishkat al-Anwar, the niche for lights. Also, al-Ghazali on knowing yourself and God. The other one is Inner Dimensions of Islamic Worship. Also, he has an interesting um, book about the uh, guidance, which is the beginning of guidance. And also my favorite, my favorite book of Imam al-Ghazali, which is The Remembrance of Death and the, Her uh, the Hereafter. Kitabu uh, Dhikri al-Mawti wa ma ba'dahu. While this is not a video about Imam al-Ghazali, the point that I'm trying to make is that the true scholar is the one who tries to find a solution to the issues of the Muslim Ummah. The confused scholars, however, that tour the mosques to give inspirational lectures or false hope are not scholars. These are called storytellers. The scholars of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ throughout the Islamic history, including Imam al-Ghazali, were more concerned about the state of the Ummah instead of giving these useless speeches. All major battles in Islamic history were prepared by the scholars for victory. This is the source of the problem. Many true scholars are jailed and killed, while celebrity scholars are promoted. Victory, wallahi, victory will not be achieved unless we rally true scientists and sincere scholars around us. We do have the potential to overcome the current situation, the given political and the spiritual defeat in Palestine. We must first overcome the ego and repel the, the whispers of the shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned 
us against this in the Quran, saying, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولا تيأس من روح الله إنه لا لا يأس من روح الله إلا القوم الكافرون and never give up hope of Allah subhanahu wa taala's mercy. Certainly, no one despairs of Allah's mercy except the people who disbelieve. Notice that Allah subhanahu wa taala equated despair to the brink of disbelief because this kind of despair means as if we're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the omnipotent, the powerful, the all-knowing, the all-wise, then we say, but if only accept, as if our knowledge is better than God the Almighty, the all-wise. It is completely okay to feel this defeat as we experience one of the worst travesties, one of the worst calamities ever to befall on our generation. It's okay and necessary to feel weak but not despair. Otherwise, we won't be able to get back on our feet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us examples from different prophets where they expressed the kind of weakness in different circumstances, whether they are uh, matters that are related to their deen and da'wah or matters that are even personal. Jacob, Ya'qub alayhi salam, was weak when he lost Yusuf alayhi salam and almost went blind over not only a da'wah related matter, but also an emotional loss. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dedicated a whole surah for a personal issue, and people don't realize that. It's a surah that details how a father was grieving over his son, who was taken away from him. So it's really remarkable then when we, we, we think about uh, this surah. Also, Mary, Jesus' mother, alayhi salam, is another example. She's a saint, she's a Siddiqah, one of the highest degree of believers. And yet she says, I wish I was dead. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ليتني مت قبل هذا وكنت نسيا منسيا. I wish I was dead before this and I wish I was totally forgotten, which means I wish I was never born. Now, if you say this phrase today, people will translate it as a suicidal thought. It's actually not. She didn't say, Ya laytani amut. This is an inner thought. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was coding. I wish I would die, she said. I wish I was dead, meaning I wish I did not have to endure what I'm enduring right now. And then what is really remarkable, that one of his greatest miracles is that Jesus spoke as a newborn. And what was his first words? Jesus' first word was, do not be sad. So the first thing that Jesus السلام, uttered in his life was, do not be sad. To who? To his beloved mother. Notice that this first word was not a message for humanity, was not a message for the people whom he was sent to, to call them to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jesus' first word was basically making sure that his mother feels okay addressing her emotions. And in Islamic psychology, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pinpointed the emotions that she was going through. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, do not be angry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, do not be scared. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do not be sad. So the reason I'm mentioning this is that sometimes we go between the two extremes mentioned earlier, but we become saddened to the point of losing hope completely, or we become delusional in the sense that we don't realize what's happening or the reality or what's going around, you know, uh, around us as a collective ummah. And this, for most of the time, impacts Muslims when they're about to take strategic decisions or choices. Because part of being strategic is that you have a correct assessment of our reality. We are hopeful in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Him to grant victory and support but we also believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-wise, all-knowing. 
and we don't know the things he has predestined. Our hope cannot and will not change necessarily uh, what is predestined. There is a moral dilemma that's taking place in the Muslim world right now, whereby we have this sense of just utter reliance on the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point that we abstain from any action. It is absolutely devastating what is happening right now. And what we are saying, seeing right now on a daily basis is hard for any Muslim to feel a state of contentment. Some of the spiritual remedies we could all benefit from in a time of serious crisis and devastation while we see Palestinian parents carrying out their children, bring, bringing out their children from the debris or burnt alive these fathers and mothers in Palestine while grieving over their children, they're also saying Alhamdulillah, having this satisfaction in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for them. But it's a miracle to go through what the brothers, our brothers and sisters in Palestine are going through and still have this satisfaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This in itself is a kind of a living miracle. They're able to see that despite the ugliness of what's happening, that there is a subtle gentleness in it because uh, the timeline of our existence is not bound by our existence on this earth. Our existence extends before coming to this planet and extends beyond this planet as well. To sum up, stay strong, pray, pray, and pray, even in time of hardship as it is in time of ease. Alhamdulillah, our Iman is getting even more fortified and thriving even through our sufferings and losses. Allahumma jma' shaman al-Muslimina mustad'afina fi kulli makan. Allahumma wahid sufuf al-Muslimina. Wajma' kalimtahum ala al-haqqi wa alif bayna qulubihim. Wahdihim subul as-salam. Wansurhum ala man aadahum wa a'li bihim rayat al-deen. Allahumma arham du'af al-Muslimin. Wa kun lahum awna. واجعلهم واجعل لهم واجعل واجعلهم لك طائعين ومؤمنين واجبر بخاطرهم يا رب المستضعفين اللهم احفظ قلوبنا من الضلال والشتات واجعل قلوبنا معلقه بك انك على كل شيء قدير اللهم اعز الاسلام والمسلمين اللهم اعز الاسلام والمسلمين اللهم اعز الاسلام والمسلمين برحمتك يا رب العالمين اللهم ارزقنا حسن الخاتمة واجعلنا يا رب يا رب آخر ما ننطق به هي شهادة أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم ثبت أقدامنا على الصراط المستقيم وثبتنا على دينك حتى يقوم الحساب اللهم اللهم لم لم شمل الأمة محمد عليه الصلاة والسلام ووحد كلمتهم وأكفهم شر الفتن إنك على كل شيء قدير وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته